Hello, and thank you all for joining us today for this morning's press conference on the Travel and Tourism Development Index that was released just this morning by the World Economic Forum. This study looks at 117 economies and benchmarks how they perform on different factors that are critical to the sustainability and resilience of their travel and tourism sectors long term. Fortunately today, I'm joined with an absolutely excellent group of panelists to discuss the report findings as well as the topic of sustainable travel as a whole. I have with me today Pr President Luis Abinader of the Dominican Republic. I also have Ms. Lauren Uppink, Head of Aviation, Travel, and Tourism at the World Economic Forum. And finally, I have Ms. Ruzwina Bahir, CEO of Peak.com. Thank you all so much for joining us today. As I mentioned, just this morning, the World Economic Forum released its latest Travel and Tourism Development Index. So Lauren, I think I'll go right to you, and can you tell us a little bit about how your team developed this index and what your findings were? Absolutely. So thank you. In the Travel and Tourism Development Index, it's the first edition of this index this year. It actually is built off uh, 15 years of the Travel and Tourism Competitiveness Index, but it has been redeveloped a new, with a new framework, um, new pillars and indicators to really look at how we can build forward in a more sustainable and resilient manner, making the tourism sector more robust um, and more able to withstand shocks and such as the pandemic and others, whether they be environmental or um, health related or geopolitical. So we've done that with, by including a number of new indicators related to sustainability, socioeconomic conditions. And really, as you all have seen, the pandemic has impacted the sector dramatically. We, we estimate that there's 62 million jobs lost. One in, all, one in five jobs lost globally are estimated to have come from the travel and tourism sector over the period of the pandemic. And we lost about 4.5 trillion in GDP related to travel and tourism. But we are recovering. So fortunately, uh, in January 2022, we saw a, the improvement we saw from in comparison to January 2021 was more in international arrivals than we saw over the, the growth of the whole of 2021. So there is promise, we're excited, and some markets are really taking um, opportunity from that. But there, the recovery is certainly uneven. It's not a, a surprise to all of you. Um, and that is reliant on different uh, border closures that still remain, vaccination rates in different economies. It also has, an, has been impacted by supply chain challenges, labor shortages, um, and of course, geopolitical conflict. So that recovery is mixed and more will need to be done by a number of economies to really build forward. Um, I want to share the, the exciting part of who tops the index this year. That's Japan. Um, they've come in as the new leader in the top 10. And I think they're an ex excellent example of what we've tried to build with this tool. Um, they perform really well in air transport infrastructure, ground transport infrastructure, which allows people to visit a number of destinations around the country. Um, our previous edition of the report of the competitiveness index showed the risk of things like overcrowding, the degradation of natural and cultural resources, and um, their ability to disperse tourists and move them around to different destinations for different reasons is part of their success um, in topping the index. They also do really well on demand drivers, and what we mean is what do you and I want to, to visit? And we rank that against cultural drivers, uh, natural attractions, and non-leisure attractions. Um, non-leisure being universities, uh, Forbes 2000 headquarters, um, what, what is bringing business travelers to your country too? And so they perform very well across all three of those, so there's different reasons for attracting visitors. And lastly, they perform well on socioeconomic resilience and conditions, which given the impact of the pandemic and the, the status of a lot of workers in travel and tourism, often being from marginalized groups or from lower e uh, economic environments, having good social security nets, having good workers' rights, good conditions for supporting those workers in times of crisis um, gives them more ability to um, really, in the long run, build a resilient, secure sector. And so with that, I'll hand back to you. Thank you so much, Lauren. Mr. President, I'll turn to you now. Um, 
hearing what we just heard from Lauren and considering the future shocks that might come from COVID-19 or the effects of climate change, how are you looking at the future of travel and tourism in the Dominican Republic? Hey, thank you very much. Thank you for uh, this presentation of the uh, World Economic Forum Index in Tourism. Um, I think it's, it's very important, all the statistics, and uh, in order that we can follow up with the uh, appropriate uh, public policies. I see the tourism in Dominican Republic in a very optimistic and positive way. Of course, we are in very special circumstances, uh, and we have to be followed uh, every week. We have a, a tourism cabinet, which I am the head of the tourism cabinet, and the Minister of Tourism is the executive director. We work in every area of uh, uh, of the uh, government. Uh, part of this uh, tourism cabinet, uh, we have the Minister of Health because of the pandemic, the Minister of Security, of, of Defense, uh, the Interior and Security, and Minister of Defense, in order that we can have just one voice and one executive policies coordinated uh, with all the government. And uh, we had. Uh, the, the tourism from the, for, just to put an example, from the United States, it has been growing. Uh, now it's starting to grow again tourism from Canada, which has been our second uh, country of visiting. Uh, we had visitors from Russia, but now uh, you know the situation, even from Ukraine, you know the situation. The last plane that came to Kiev before the, one, before the, world, uh, the world was from Punta Cana the last plane that arrived at the Kiev airport. Uh, so that gives you an idea of, of how tourism uh, was growing in, in our country. But now it's starting to, to go to the same level Latin, in Latin America, Argentina, Chile, Peru. And uh, Canada is taking the, the second uh, uh, country in order for the amount of tourism that goes. We had the best year in the, the best uh, April ever in terms of tourism. We had the best, we're going to have the best May ever in tourism. We had the best December and then it came Omicron and that's why I'm saying that this is a, this, these are times that, that you have to be on top of the, uh, of the situation in order to take the correct uh, steps and, and follow up uh, with the correct policies. We were named on on the World uh, Tourism Organization uh, as the country that has the best uh, recovery in the world. Uh, we, uh, last year, uh, we had approximately a more, more than 75% of pre-COVID. And this year, we are gonna have, we're gonna go to COVID, to pre-COVID levels. And in next year, I think we will have uh, the, and I don't know if this year, uh, but next year we'll have the best year ever in, in tourism. So we are very positive. Investment has been flowing. Uh, this year we'll have the, the, the more, in tourist, the more uh, foreign investment in, in tourism ever. Uh, and speaking about the other and complementary uh, uh, programs for tourism. Uh, right now, there are, we are building, the private sector is building two theme parks in Punta Cana. Uh, one, the Melia Hotels with Kathmandu, and, and uh, the other, uh, uh, Cap Cana, uh, with a, a, a environmental uh, and a special uh, theme park in, in terms of a natural, a, a natural things that we can show in the country. Uh, so we are very optimistic, we are very positive. We know we still have at the, at the, at the rest of the year uh, difficulties, but we are prepared to uh, jump on those problems and, and, and as we did with the pandemic, uh, it has uh, public policies that can uh, make the solution and Dominican Republic has a safety 
uh, it's a safety destination. It's in every way, in security, in, in health. And our people love tourism, and that's, I think, the most important part. Dominicans love uh, to have a, a tourist in our country. And because of that and because of the economic climate and the incentive for investment, uh, we will continue to grow uh, in, in a very good way for our economy. Thank you, Mr. President. Ms. Bashir. 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 Sorry. <laughs> Ms. Bashir. Um, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about uh, small and local businesses because I know Peak.com has worked a lot with that group of companies that does a ton in the travel and tourism sector. How have they adapted to new tourism trends and how might their recovery look different from larger companies in the industry? Yeah, um, thanks. Um, so uh, with Peak.com, just to give folks a little context. Um, we're a platform for experiences. We work with uh, thousands of small businesses to medium-sized businesses that in things that range from water sports and zip lining to kind of museum experiences and uh, cooking classes. And so um, we've had a couple of billion dollars of bookings through the platform. And so we've been really able to work with lots of small businesses and get a sense of, of what's been going on for them. And I, I'd say that, um, you know, First, a record number of SMBs were created during the pandemic in the US. Uh, and I think that what we do see is um, entrepreneurs being incredibly creative, especially as you see emerging trends. And I think one of the big emerging trends that certainly that you've seen very strong, uh, a strong trend in America has been around more local and domestic travel. In the context of the pandemic, I think that we saw folks were not able to travel, but they were still able to experience new things closer to home. And so, you know, what we've seen is, um, you know, people really being very creative and thinking through ways in which they might be able to help a, a local experience their neighborhood um, or even travel 50 to 100 miles away uh, and have an adventure. And so whether that's a, an, a farm experience, going apple picking with your kids, um, through to things that, that perhaps might be a little bit more adventurous, we've seen a lot of that happening. I also think that, you know, one of the, the powerful aspects of SMBs in, uh, is, is that they're incredibly creative about how they think about what, what is possible. So, for example, we have a partner in London um, called Unseen Tours where they provide street tours uh, of the UK in the streets of London uh, and they actually reskill homeless people in order to do that. And so, you know, I really think one of the powerful aspects of what SMBs have been doing during this period is taking this opportunity to help educate people about their own cities, but also um, to be able to create jobs and awareness for those uh, that might not be served very well otherwise. And so um, I think the rise of local and domestic you know, tourism um, is uh, is going to bolster the economy um, in this sector uh, a little bit, especially as we kind of come into what is very likely uh, a serious recession. Um, and I think that, you know, where tourism may still be decreasing, I think people will still look to do uh, things that connect them. I think experiences uh, drive our joy. Um, you know, we have a lot of you know, in the US especially, a lot of savings. So even though consumer sentiment is going down, I do think people will still be uh, spending their money on experiences. You've seen that consistently happen as a trend versus spending money on products. And so I think I think we'll see more of that. I think one of the last things I touch upon is that sustainability does matter to, to folks. And so, um, you know, one trend that we've seen um, is that actually a lot of consumers are demanding that. You know, about 80% of people when polled will say, actually sustainability matters to me. But about half of them will say, I won't change my choices based on it. So, you know, what we see is a, a market and a trend where I think um, entrepreneurs and SMBs are trying to meet that need and say, how can we be more sustainable so that folks are more likely to pick me over anything else? And so I think those are all important trends. The last thing I'd actually speak about is, is the use of technology. I think that, um, you know, small businesses have tended not to be great at using technology, and yet that empowers and allows them access to a much broader range of customers, uh, distribution opportunities, um, and even just the, the automation uh, and opportunity it provides to reduce costs. And so we've definitely seen you know, Peak provides software. Um, we've seen a huge adoption of that as um, as you've seen almost a 10-year leap forward on digitization among small and medium-sized businesses. And I think that will continue, especially in a recessionary environment where people have to be a lot more cautious uh, about what they're doing and have to find new sources of demand. 
And that demand is both local, but I think as companies come back, you will see that that demand um, gets into more of the remote working and offsite component. We've seen that that you know whether that there's a lot of uh, talk about leisure, you know, business and, and leisure being put together. But I actually think one of the emerging trends we're going to see is around companies that have gone remote, which we see a lot of in the US, um, needing to kind of find ways to connect their team and their workforce, uh, whether that's in regular uh, on, uh, off-site kind of occasions or virtual experiences that are happening online regularly. So that's where I'll wrap. Thank you so much. I think on that note, we'll open the room up for questions from the floor. Um, a couple of my colleagues will be walking around with hand mics, so yes, sir. Uh, Chris Hermack from Monocle. Uh, maybe a question to uh, Ms. Umpink and, and Mr. President as well, but uh, Ms. Umpink, I wonder how the, I guess how when you, when you looked at sort of adjusting this index as a result of the pandemic with Japan also coming out on top, how did the pandemic itself impact that and how you thought about Japan? Was it, in a way, some of the things you're describing, that sort of infrastructure within a country becomes more important because of what happened in the pandemic and that it was important to spread it out? Was that related, I suppose? And a question to you, Mr. President, similar, I suppose. Did, did the pandemic make you think differently about tourism, the kind of infrastructure that you need within your country in order to be successful? No, All right, so thank you. That's a really good question. We actually started to review the index prior to the pandemic starting. When we published the last edition of the report, we, we really looked at the possibility of travel and tourism really degrading all of the assets that, and the attractions that it depends upon um, through over-demand, over over-competitiveness, mass tourism. So we were already seeing some trends necessary to spread tourism. More mature markets have a bit more difficulty in doing that. But um, being able to, to diversify the tourism opportunities in a country, spread the, the economic benefit to communities and different, um, different components of the industry, and so that was a really the, the framework with which we went into it. We also worked with an, an advisory council that included, for example, the UN World uh, Tourism Organization, looking at what are the things we need to prioritize or encourage countries to prioritize as they move forward. So that was the intent with which we went into it. And of course, when the pandemic hit, um, and we saw the major impact of a health crisis, but we had in our minds the, the impact of climate change, um, the, the potential for over-tourism, we, we looked at how, did we, how do we measure the indicators that would help us to, to recognize the interconnectedness of the different parts of an economy that relate to travel and tourism, and how can we um, demonstrate countries that are starting to achieve this more and more, or thinking of this, this integrated approach. And so we brought in we already had some health and safety conditions in the original index, but we brought in more. We created an entire sustainability pillar where it's not just environmental sustainability, but socioeconomic resilience and conditions. And so the pandemic really only exacerbated the need for this change because we didn't want to encourage countries to just grow. We were seeing unprecedented growth in the travel and tourism industry before the pandemic. We wanted to ensure that for us to continue to see benefit out of that, we did it in a sustainable and resilient manner. Well, I think that the pandemic changed our view in everything, uh, and, and in every po public policy that you you address from, from now on. But in tourism, in our economy and in Latin America, you have to think that uh, in terms of the GDP impact, apart from the small countries of the Caribbean, uh, the small island, and we, are, we were the biggest country in, of, in terms of the tourism impact on our economy. You see other countries as even Brazil, some people think about tourism, and, but Brazil, part, the part of tourism in the economy is very, is very small and it's a very close economy. Or even Chile, Chile doesn't have an impact in tourism, Argentina very small. Uruguay it has, uh, and it was one of the, I think it was the second or the third country that had the recover, the most recovered. President Lacalle did a very good job on that. 
uh, but we had the biggest impact of, on our GDP. So to recover my economy was to recover tourism. And, and I have been saying that because that was our, our main uh, objective. So we have to we have to meet every every week with the tourism cabinet to do all the necessary measures in, for that. And and you have to think that this was a change uh, every week from every country. So United States had one uh, a specific requirement, and then Canada had another one, and then Europe changed uh, another one. So we have to be. Uh, when we went into the cabinet meeting, we said, what is the change of the day? Uh, wh what is the crisis of the day? Uh, how we have to adapt to that? And then they changed that they had to do PCR tests. So we had to look for all the PCR tests and to buy and to rent a plane and to go directly to Dominican Republic in order to be prepared for that. But we had to do it because uh, we had thousands of Dominicans who depend on the job, on tourism. So we were on top of that, and we were trying to, as far as we could do, to make a solution to that. And it helped us, and I think also in, in a lot of countries, that uh, they, our health infrastructure, and not just the public health infrastructure, uh, it, had to, it had to become a reality. So we had to have at, a, at least uh, a, a, a second rate uh, uh, hospital, uh, a second uh, we, we call it in Spanish un hospital de segundo nivel, where, where you can have surgery and special surgery, and sometimes even a hospital of, of a third level uh, in every tourist destination. And we did. And as, as I said in a, yesterday, we, we, we also created ourselves. And we said, uh, with the statistics that we have, that people want to travel. And I just want to say something at the end about the uh, crisis, an economic crisis. Well, people want to travel, but they don't want to get sick where they travel, and that's what they were afraid of. So we created a, the first COVID insurance in the world. So we gave a free COVID insurance to every tourist that came to our country. And that gave trust and, and confidence for people to travel to our country, and that's in terms of relative uh, terms, we were the country who most recovered in the world uh, from the COVID crisis. Uh, concerning, the, and, and I want to finalize with this, uh, concerning the uh, economic crisis that could come, uh, actually in the first trimester it came to the United States, they, they had a, 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 the economy a, had a decrease of I think 1.4. My, I am an economist, uh, so I believe that every crisis is different. So uh, this crisis is very different from the other economic crisis that we had before. And because the, and it was said here, the sector that was, that had the more impact and the, the more negative impact on the pandemic economic crisis was the tourism sector. And now it's starting to recover all over the world, with the exception of some countries, especially in, the, in China. I believe that even if can come a recession, that we, I think it could be a mild recession, I think that the tourism part will not be part of that recession. It will continue to grow. I think the economic recession will, co will come in other parts of the economy. because. It can, you can, it can be, uh, the recession cannot uh, come from the so low that it comes the tourism part. I don't know if you uh, I can explain very well. So I, I believe that it could be an economic recession, but I think that the still the recovery of tourism will continue. Thank you. Are there any other questions? We probably have time for one more, if there are. Okay. If anyone has any other final thoughts to offer before we close out that you want to share with those gathered here in Davos today, please, please do. We'd love to hear. I think um, it was mentioned by both of my colleagues around the sustainability and the opportunity for nat natural tourism and experiences, local experiences. As we start to see many more people traveling to those destinations, we will be need to be careful that we don't see the same challenge again, that those places become um, oversubscribed. And so putting in the right policies now 
um, learning from the pandemic will be crucial for the, the travel and tourism in, uh, industry. And we hope that the index can be used as a tool to do that, um, enabling both businesses and policymakers to really think carefully. And I, I really appreciate what you're saying about your tourism cabinet, because we've seen some of the countries that have recovered quicker have been those that have really put tourism as a, a whole of government approach, looking at um, all of the different components like healthcare, like uh, policy, and making sure that those pieces inter interconnect and can be, depend on each other. And so we're excited about the recovery um, and look forward to, to supporting both uh, country partners and industry to see that grow. I completely agree with that as well. I think it's incredibly important that policymakers are involved as well as private kind of entrepreneurs uh, to do this. And I think, you know, we, we talked that the big opportunity here is to, to diversify, right? You know, we used to go to specific place. We might, first off, only have a subset of places that we might visit. And then we had three or four major attractions that everybody wanted to go to. I think we are, you know, within the context uh, of, of of those building, um, you know, sites for for consumers, um, we're beginning to realize that people have different preferences, right? So if I'm a foodie or I'm a musician or I love adventure with mountain biking or fishing, um, there's an opportunity to actually help you redefine what your three or four uh, biggest kind of uh, attractions might be. And that diversity as you empower entrepreneurs to be able to meet that demand um, creates a lot of opportunity. And I think where folks are flexible and agile enough to, to, to create those businesses to serve those needs, that's helpful, but it also creates an opportunity for us to, to go to new places, but also expand our horizon and what might be possible to do in a way that allows us to meet the consumer demands and needs, um, but also helps you know diversify the opportunity in that local economy. I just want to add that when, when you mentioned the private sector, when, when we speak about cabinet tourism, our expanded cabinet tourism is also had a, a, a big part of the of the private sector. We have we have the uh, the association of hotels, the association of restaurants, uh, the unions, uh, especially on the transport part. Uh, so we involve in our decision. It's not just a government decision. It's, it's it's a part of the whole tourism sector. When when you make sometimes uh, during the pandemic very harsh decisions, you have to count on on every part. And and for us. Uh, our philosophy as a government is always to have consensus. It's always to speak with the social, uh, with the social sector and the private sector, and I think a big part of our success has been those consensus and and those unified criteria to execute in our country as a public policy, but as a policy for all. Thank you so much. I think that's a good note to close out the panel on. Thank you to all the panelists for joining us. It, I think we all really benefited from your insights. And thank you to all of, all of you who joined today in the room and also watching on the live stream.